Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, traumatic injuries to the hip. <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Elior, what do you think of this case? Yeah, it's it, the screen is green for me. I can't see it. Oh, can anybody? Can everybody else see it or not? I I see it. Okay, now now I can see it. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay, so there's a radiograph. Right. So just this deformity with just amorphous calcifications where the hip joints should be. Just the the lower pelvic bones are are missing. Yeah, and it's very discombobulated joints on both sides. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think about the sacrum? The sacrum, yeah, as well. I don't see the, the lower half of the sacrum. So what do you think might be going on here? Um, I think a congenital, maybe a genesis of the pelvic bones. Uh, let me see. Oh, 41. Okay. <laughs> From birth, okay, yeah, I'd, I'd say a genesis. Yeah, nice to see the knees, etc. Yeah, so so this is a genesis. The patient uh, was uh, had no feeling below the this level, and this is really Charcot disease in someone who had uh, congenital uh, a genesis of the sacrum. Good. Okay, good. Very good. So trauma, we'll talk about transient marrow edema, trabecular fractures, cortical fractures, and some fecial injuries. Uh, let's look at a few uh, measurements that we can, <clears throat> that they sometimes come in helpful. So uh, we have the superior joint space, which is uh, three to seven millimeters. We have the medial joint space, which is typically around 11 millimeters. And then they have the, as, the teardrop uh, line, uh, and then Kohler's line, SI joints, and, and so forth. So, the, so this is the, uh, the superior joint space. There is the medial joint space, which should be around 11. There is a teardrop sign. Uh, <clears throat> uh, here is Kohler's line from the inside here down to the uh, inferior pubic ramus, uh, and uh, then obviously the SI joint should be between two and four, and the symphysis pubis should be less than five millimeters. You don't have a Shenton sign there, do you? I don't have a Shenton sign there. I'm uh, not sure whether I'm going to have that later or not. Why don't you tell us about the Shenton sign, John? It's the neck of the um, femur. Uh, that uh, coincides with the pubic ramus uh, here. It's the same kind of a line that you can draw from the neck that curves to the pubis. Right, exactly. Okay. It, it's not that accurate, so that's probably why you uh, yeah. you don't have it in your rep repertoire. Okay. Okay. It's very helpful in slip capital as well. Great. Uh, Tayson, what do you think of this case? All right, looking at the left hip, it looks like there's diffuse marrow edema within the proximal femoral head and neck. Yeah. That may be, I'd certainly be concerned about. Uh, uh, valgus deformity here, coxa valga as well. Mm -hmm. so there we can see the edema. Sagittal, this is an old study, T1 weighted image, uh, not great, but here we can see there's a little flattening of the uh, subchondral bone there and marrow edema. And uh, so marrow edema, uh, you know, as you know, can be as an indicator of a lot of different bone pathology. But the, the vast majority of time in an area where they have trauma, it's going to be due to trabecular fractures and hemorrhage and loss of the normal fat signal within the bone uh, due to that. Uh, here, here we can see a case, the patient's symptomatic on the left. 
we can see a lot of inhomogeneity on the T1-weighted images, and now on the STIR images, we can see increased signal intensity compatible with uh, with edema, and uh, especially down here around the uh, in uh, a lesser uh, trochanter. And there we can see the edema on uh, sagittal images, a really typical subchondral edema here anteriorly, uh, which is a very common area where you get it, most likely because this is an area of weight-bearing when people sit. In osteoporotic people, if they do a lot of sitting, they can actually get stress fractures of the subchondral bone anteriorly here uh, due to the force of, uh, of sitting uh, as well as uh, other trauma. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, typically, people will come in and present with pain, and you'll see the edema. Uh, on MR scan, this is called transient bone marrow edema syndrome. On x-rays, you'll often see lucency in this area, uh, which is uh, uh, can also improve within uh, two, to, two to three months, uh, <clears throat> uh, which is uh, transient osteoporosis. Okay, uh, Elior. New onset right hip pain. Right. So in the proximal femur, we see uh, T1 low signal in the femoral head and neck. That could be right. edema. Right. Now, now, traditionally, this was thought to be due to avascular necrosis of the hip. And here there's a lack of edema sign, which would make you suspicious for that. But AVN is usually very serpiginous in its margins. You really need to have a double line sign to really make that diagnosis on an MR examination. Much more commonly, we now know in the hips, uh, when you have pain of the hips, it's due to uh, trabecular bone injuries of the femoral head, not osteonecrosis. And it's important to make the appropriate diagnosis, as I'll point out in a case uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And uh, this is often called, it often gets better. Over, uh, this is six months later. And this is a T1-weighted image showing resolution of the edema. On the PD facet images, we can see, or these are stir, I think, we can just see a little residual edema within the neck, which improves. So before we'd call this uh, transient bone marrow edema syndrome, X-rays transient osteoporosis, uh, the bottom line is uh, these really fit, and where there's been histology, uh, these are trabecular bone injuries. Uh, they're basically insufficiency fractures. And what's important is whether the subchondral bone is intact. If you get impaction of the subchondral bone, uh, that uh, has a high risk of going on to degenerative joint disease later. If you can preserve the subchondral bone and it can heal without impactions of the subchondral bone, then the prognosis is quite good in, in these individuals. But uh, I just uh, urge you not to call these AVN unless you see very specific signs of AVN, and I'll show a case later as to why that's very important. One thing, these are very painful. Yes. My mentor was a patient of mine and the local hospital, and I took care of him, and he needed morphine. Yeah, uh, for a couple of days, and then after that, I, I let him go in about a week or two on crutches. But uh, he didn't develop osteoporosis uh, for about ten days. Yeah. Okay. Here's uh, that's before MRI, John. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And here's a case where again we can see the. Uh, this is an old study before the days of fat suppression. And we can see the uh, decreased signal intensity on the T1-weighted image. The bone scan shows marked avid uptake, which is characteristic of this. We used to use that, uh, the bone scan, a lot in the past, uh, not so much anymore now that we can. Uh, MR is more sensitive, and it's, it's actually more specific in making the, the diagnosis than, than bone scans. Okay, uh, Taysen. All right, looks like we have a lot of bone marrow edema in the right femoral head and neck with a low signal fracture line traversing the neck. Uh, be a stress injury there. Well, he developed hip pain two weeks after exercise. This was done two weeks after 
The exercise is September 21st, 2010, and we can see extensive bone marrow edema extending down into the entrotrochanteric region. Left side is normal, and that's where his pain was. Sagittal images, we can see a diffuse edema pattern, no double line sign, kind of indistinct margins, very characteristic of trabecular bone injury. Uh, the patient continued to have symptoms, and this is nine to this was nine twenty one. This is this is about uh, a month later, and they came in with this. Uh, what do you think of this one, Taysom? On here, I think there is some irregularity of the uh, contour of the femoral head more superiorly now, right? There is a little irregularity there, and that that was worrisome at this particular time. <clears throat> so for some reason, the uh, some somebody that this he was this was a, a physician's assistant. Uh, somebody uh, asked him to call me and take a look at his IVR scans because they were recommending doing a, a hip replacement of the right hip at this particular time. So he came in and he showed me uh, these images, and I told him there there could be a little bit of a subchondral fracture at this location, uh, but what I see is actually beginning healing of a stress fracture. And there's no uh, reason to do a hip replacement right away. And I recommended that he wait and allow this to heal uh, before going on with a hip replacement. And that's what he decided to do. So this was 10-17-2010, seeing some improvement in the bone edema. The sagittal images, the subchondral bone looks pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so uh, he decided not to have surgery. Now he came back uh, about... about uh, you know, a month and a half later, and this is what it showed. What do you think? All right, I think the marrow edema has resolved, and there's still just some mild irregularity, subchondral bone at the femoral head. Right. So he was much better at this time. He was walking without crutches or anything and uh, wanted to go back uh, into doing exercising again. Here are the sagittal images. Again, I think the subchondral bone looks like it's pretty much intact, though I was, was concerned about the signal loss in the immediate subchondral bone. So I recommended that, that he not uh, get in any uh, uh, marked physical activity until there's further healing at this time. Uh, and now he came back a couple of months after that, and at this time, uh, he was basically asymptomatic. Okay. Yeah, I mean, some irregularity there, but it's pretty much the same as before. Yeah. And then we can see a little bit of irregularity. So I told him that. And I told him that basically this might go on to produce more degenerative disease, and he might have to have a hip replacement at some time in the future. But at this time, he was... He was asymptomatic, really, and wanted to go back to running and, and exercise, uh, and it was getting better. So this is basically a, a transient bone marrow edema. Here he came back. Uh, <clears throat> actually, he just came back just to get an MR scan to follow it and see what happened. He was completely asymptomatic and was back doing full exercise again in July. So what do you think about uh, July now? I think there's... Further healing of that injury there, just some persistent subchondral. Yeah. Edema. So this was this is now about ten months after uh, the injury, and here we can see a little bit of subchondral bone uh, changes there, and uh, he, he was back doing uh, even started jogging at this particular time, and now now this is uh, about a year and a half after the uh, incident, and he came back. Uh, completely asymptomatic, back doing normal activity. What do you think now? Looks like near complete healing of that area of concern. Yeah, and his back full activity. So, so the bottom line is, uh, I, I think the majority of what we thought in the past of transient uh, osteopenia and transient bone marrow edema is not really AVN. I think uh, these are predominantly trabecular injuries, um, and uh, uh, if there is no structural deformity, it's best to let these heal before thinking about doing a hip uh, replacement. And here you can see there's still a little resi residual signal, but he was uh, completely asymptomatic. 
Uh, I would recommend that uh, walking and yeah. uh, not uh, jogging for this fellow. Uh huh. I I I think that makes sense. He was more aggressive than that. Uh, well, uh, that's his problem. Right. Exactly. Uh, this was a study that we published uh, a long time ago in radiology. We looked at 70 patients presented with high clinical suspicion of hip fracture, but who had negative x-rays, and we performed an MR examination. Uh, uh, what we found, uh, uh, if we had positive uh, MR findings, uh, that 37% of these patients ended up having femoral fractures, 23% had pelvic fractures, 61% had soft tissue edema. Most of the time we thought that that was hemorrhage from the underlying bone fracture, but some of them might have been muscle strains. AVN only in 3%, which is, uh, and then uh, we just saw trochanteric bursitis in a 4%. The bottom line is we could make a definitive diagnosis in 80% of the patients who came in with hip pain and negative x-rays. So this is uh, one of the early studies that showed that MR uh, could significantly uh, add value uh, in evaluating patients who have negative x-rays but suspected uh, bone trauma. And this is one of a number of publications we had back in the early 1990s that showed that MR was much more sensitive and specific for looking at bone injuries. So let's go on and look at other kinds of fractures, femoral neck fractures, complete and incomplete, <laughs> intertrochanteric fractures, and others. John, did you want to say something? No, I just coughed. Ah, okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Whose turn is it? It's mine. Okay. Um, yeah, looking at the radiograph here, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm seeing anything. Okay. So yeah, this is a uh, polytomogram. We can see what looks like pretty normal bone and so forth. Here's what the this is a, as you can see very old MR T1 weighted MR study. What does it show? Mm -hmm. uh, low signal in the femoral. Neck, yeah. So this was actually okay. before we really. Sub I'm, so, I'm sorry. That's a subcapsule yeah. yeah. mm -hmm. portion of the neck. And then uh, this the this was before we actually had good quality CT scans. This is a polytomogram, as you can uh, see, and it really looks pretty normal. The trabecular pattern looks pretty normal in that area. The MR scan is clearly abnormal. Uh, here. Here's another example of an x-ray that was pretty unremarkable. Here's a frog leg view that maybe there's a little lucency here, but the trabecular pattern looks intact. And then here on the MR examination, we can see some small area of trabecular bone injury uh, on the T1-weighted image. Uh, these are early STIR images, and we can see bone marrow edema in that area on the right side, the asymptomatic side, uh, was fine. And again, it showed that MR, as you all know now, uh, is much more sensitive for bone injuries than x-ray-based technologies. But in this day and age, uh, these are quite surprising. Okay, uh, Taysen. All right. I'm not sure I'm seeing much here. Yeah, a lot of osteopenia. Here are the MR examinations. These are old PD fat sat sequences. Uh, looks like there is some low signal uh, lines at the femoral neck bilaterally. And if you go back here, again, the x rays are pretty negative. Even in yeah, there's only one thing that I uh, catches my eye, and you go back to the X-ray. Yeah. If you look at the lesser trochanter on the on the right side, it's more prominent than on the left. That means that the leg is externally rotated. But to me, um, and the left is not. And this other there's a little 
um, valgus on the left side that you don't need, maybe a little virus on the right. But okay. That's, a, that's just, just a uh, kind of a suspicious a little bit. Okay. Good. Here we can see these bilateral signal abnormalities from the, the femoral heads. Here we can see. Yeah, that's that's, uh, I'm sorry, John. To, one thing about uh, what I said was uh, when you have a fractured hip, it's almost always externally rotated uh, as far as the okay. leg's concerned. Good. Uh, and inter internal rotation produces quite a bit of pain and uh, it's not tolerated. So, thank you, uh, John. That's something to watch. I've always watched a lesser stroke before the age of MRI. Good. That's great. And here it just shows a teratoma here, which was producing osteomalacia. So this was kind of bilateral uh, stress injuries in a patient with osteomalacia due to a teratoma, which was also diagnosed on the on the hip study. Okay. Uh, Elior. I'm looking at the right femoral neck. I see um, low signal. This is a T1 weighted sequence. I I would think that's another region of uh, stress injury. Okay. And if we go to the PD fat sat images, maybe there's a little cox of valga here, but we can see that there is bone marrow edema there. The cortical bone appears intact. Maybe a little bit of a an early stress fracture right in the middle of this area of edema. Yeah, and this was a calcarneural, calcar uh, stress fracture. Okay, uh, Taysen. All right, so looking at this bone scan, I don't see any asymmetric abnormal uptake in the hips. There is some uptake in the lower spine, probably a facet. Okay. Here's the MR scan. It looks like some, maybe some low T1 signal in the right yeah. femoral neck. This is in the early, uh, the late 1980s. And then this is a stir sequence and we can see that a little bit of increased edema bilaterally here, much more on the right than on the left. And uh, again, we can see it more on the right than on the left. Okay, and then this was, uh, uh, these were bilateral stress, stress injuries. A nursing home. Yeah. And here we can see a, one of the very early MRs that we did of the hips and T1 weighted image, and we can see a, an incomplete fracture involving the uh, subcapital bone on the right side. Okay, Elior. A 64 year old female with hip pain for two weeks after a fall. The left proximal femur, we see um edema um low like a subcapital low signal um could be a non-displaced fracture right and th this patient supposedly had negative x-rays a day or two before uh, which i wasn't able to see by this time the x-rays might have been positive uh, but we didn't have them but the mri clearly shows of the stress fracture and some hemorrhage and actually some displacement and impaction here of the bone that uh, the prior x-rays didn't show. Okay. Okay. Uh, Taysen. All right. Patient walking using a cane and complaining of a groin pole. This is from Dr. Tierman. All right, so looks like we have a intertrochanteric fracture of the right femur, maybe some 
be a mild displacement. Yeah, I think there's pretty significant displacement, especially on the axials. We can see the displacement. That's the base of the neck. So. Yeah. These, these are nail. This one, you nail. You don't put in a prosthesis uh, unless the patient is really uh, elderly and uh, not going to go anywhere. But um, quite a few of these uh, subcapital fractures, if the, pa if the patient hasn't been ambulating much, you put in a prosthesis. Otherwise, you put in a can nail or a, one of those screw nails. Um, for fixation and, and they will heal with, within six to three months. I mean, six weeks to three months. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Elior. Yeah, so the left uh, femoral neck region and also extending to the femoral head, we see edema. Um, I don't see a fracture line. I do. Yeah. So this is a, this is a extensive trabecular bone injury, but I agree with you. I didn't see a fracture line. The cortical bones seem to be intact, and this was treated conservatively. Okay. Uh, Can you go back on that one more thing, John? Um, if you notice the inferior calcar is not involved uh, as much as a superior, mm -hmm. and uh, that's important because the inferior, if if that's not fractured, you can treat these people by observation. Uh, if, it, if it's the inferior calcar, then, then then that becomes more of a surgical condition. I just lost the images. Do you guys see the images? I don't. I do not. I don't either, no. What happened? Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what caused that. Can you see them now? No. Uh, no. No. So you can't see it. So what is going on here? See it now. Can you see it now? Yes. Um, yes. I don't know what happened. Okay. All right. So let's, so here's a clinical example. This was a, one of the uh, early patients that we had in Santa Barbara when I first got there. It was an elderly patient admitted to the hospital for rule out hip fracture. Uh, so these were the initial uh, uh, x-rays that were obtained. Uh, and we didn't really see any, any fractures on either side. We can see that the trabecular bone and the cortical bone look intact here. Here is a tomogram, which also didn't show a fracture. And at that, uh, the patient was in the hospital for a couple of days, had persistent pain. They were getting up the patient up and having them walk, uh, weight-bearing, uh, which the patient just refused to do. And so they got a CT scan, and this was the uh, state-of-the-art CT at the time. Uh, where we also really couldn't see any fracture. The cortical bone seems intact. The trabecular bone seems intact. So on day three, uh, they called over to the MR scanner, which was across the street from the hospital. We brought the patient in, and this is what we saw. Uh, on the right, we have a, the normal hip. On the left, we have the abnormal hip. What we now see is actually a complete fracture with displacement at the, the uh, subcapital region in the neck of the of the left femur. So it's unfortunate that we couldn't, and at this time they were really trying, they got the patient's family in, everybody was trying to get the patient to ambulate uh, with a walker in the hospital, and the patient was refusing, and now we can see why. Obviously, if you've gotten a plain femur or a CT at this time, I'm sure it would have been positive, uh, 
but this is about the time we started realizing that these need to be evaluated at the beginning with an MR and not wait to the end. Okay. Uh, You've got to believe your patient when they say you have pain. Yeah, right. The last thing I will do is give, give the patient to a physical therapist. Yeah, yeah. The family was very upset when they when they we finally made the diagnosis. I don't blame them. Yeah. Okay, so this patient had right hip pain. Let's see who's next. Uh, um, the femoral head looks intact, but there is some irregularity. Uh, superior femoral head and neck. Um. Has there been like a femoral plasty or something? I don't think there's been any surgery. Okay. Okay. Here's a, we always got the whole pelvis when we did MR scans of the hip, which we still do. So what do you think of this? Uh, looks like there is a stress fracture at the right sacral ala. Yeah, so the, 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 the remember, that uh, sacral fractures are quite common in the elderly. They often present pretty much identical to hip fractures. And a number of these that I've diagnosed really came in where they're actually diagnosing hip fractures. So you always have to look carefully at the sacrum in these individuals, especially if they're osteoporotic or, or elderly. Okay, uh, Elior. Okay, a 25-year-old postpartum female with right hip pain. Yeah, the the right hips look, they look okay. The hips look okay. Um, yeah, similarly here, the right sacral ala, there's edema. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't see a fracture on the t1 could this be a stress injury like a postpartum sort of stress yeah, injury yeah. on the stress sequence there's a little bit of a line there and maybe there's a little line uh, yeah but yeah, uh, yeah this basically is a stress fracture or a fracture of the of the sacrum Good. okay uh Tayson. all right dull pain Right hip several days. Not seeing much on the radiographs on the AP view. Yeah. Is there a little bit of. Oh. Uh, okay. Yeah. Some cortical irregularity right there at the femoral head, femoral neck on the. Oh, yeah, it looks like a intertrochanteric fracture. Yeah. John, do you want to tell us about intertrochanteric fractures? No, I've seen lots of them. Uh, yeah. And the routine is to pin them with a nail and plate. Okay. And here's another one. This is a very old study, a T1 way to study another intertrochanteric fracture. This is one of the first stirs we were ever able to do, and we could see a little bit of edema there. Here's just another intertrochanteric fracture, which we can see here. This is uh, more of an avulsion of the greater tuberosity in this particular patient. Okay. Uh, hello. Yeah, that, that, you know, excuse me a second, John. The tuberosity you have to be careful about when you operate. Um, because the, 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 the hole that you make for the nail is right below that, and uh, you don't want to displace it. So it, probably a good idea would be to either put some screws into it to, to hold it down or to put wires in there to, to hold it down. Okay. Uh, you don't want that to avulse because that becomes a real, real mess. Okay. Okay, 74 year old female Parkinson slipped on the floor, found down with the knee against her forehead. Um, yeah, radiograph the left hip. We see 
um, dislocation of the hip joint. Relocation was difficult, anterior head and posterior acetabular fractures. Um, I'm not seeing a fracture on this plane here. Oh, okay. The posterior column. Okay. Here's what yeah. I'm showing. Yeah, fracture of the posterior column there of the acetabulum. Okay. Here's a patient who came in with right hip pain, Tayson. Here's a bone scan. Uh, abnormal increase uptake region of the bilateral SI joints. Okay. And here's what the MR scan showed. Bilateral sacral fractures, which are actually quite common. Mm -hmm. And that was a patient with bilateral stress fractures. Here's a patient who came in right hip pain where we can see an extensive uh, trabecular bone injury. Maybe a little bit of irregularity of the subchondral bone here, a little bit of thinning, and maybe some disruption. Uh, but it, the morphology looks grossly intact. So uh, this is a study in, uh, in skeletal radiology. They looked at the fat-suppressed T2 appearance of femoral head insufficiency fractures. They divided them into three types, high intensity in the subchondral signal, heterogeneous signal, and low subchondral signal intensity. And uh, then they followed outcomes, uh, and that's, uh, so they found that uh, a very high percentage of those with high signal intensity on the fat-suppressed sequences healed, uh, as well as heterogeneous signal, but the low subchondral signal intensity uh, showed very poor healing. And uh, as we've known for some time, uh, where you have high signal intensity on, uh, or edema within the bone, that uh, signifies an acute lesion. The low subchondral signal intensity is usually ebernation, indicates a chronic condition. And as you would suspect, acute injuries are much more likely to heal than chronic, chronic limb injuries, which is what this confirms. All right. Uh, Tayson? Or is it Elior? Uh, yes, it's me. Um, right, so we have uh, edema in the left, uh, proximal femur that resolves a month later. Um, could this have been either a stress injury or maybe transient osteoporosis? Yeah, oh, okay. It's transient osteoporosis. There is a little bit of residual of low signal here in the uh, superior articulating subchondral bone here. So probably a little bit of a lesion like we saw in that physician's assistant. Here what the sagittal images show, there is a little bit of irregularity here, which is a little bit worrisome. But uh, over time, they tend to, to do okay. Here's someone who had right hip pain instead of a hip fracture. In this case, we can see that there's a trabecular bone injury of the acetabulum on the opposite side. Okay, uh, Tayson, person with right hip pain. All right, uh, hip joint has some mild degeneration and marginal osteophytes. Is there is that artifact down in the femoral diaphysis? Down here? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an artifact. Uh, what do you think about this uh, possible lesion here in the acetabulum? Uh, I mean, I do see a little divot of fluid there. Um, not sure. Yeah, here are the sagittal images showing it nice and smooth, a little bit of signal in it. Here are the axial images showing that fluid in it. And this is this is a normal variant. It's called a supraacetabular fossa. Okay. Uh, Elior. 
30 year old female runner with right hip pain after a fall. Um, let's see. There may be a regularity to the acetabulum. Um, kind of the posterior wall, of the acetabulum, if I'm <laughs> looking in the right place, but hmm. not, yeah, maybe, maybe there as well, maybe a, a loosened lesion the acetabulum, but well, <clears throat> not much in the femur here. Mm. What's this area in here? That's, right. that's I mean, that's a normal area. That's a, the sorsal, is it? Uh, okay. This is uh, also called a supraacetabular fossa. Okay. Right. Okay. And then uh, when we look at hip fractures, there are um, many, many classifications. One that a lot of people use is the Harris classification. One is it's isolated to the pelvic bones, avulsion injury to fra fractures, pelvic ring disruptions, insufficiency fractures, stress fractures, and acetabular fractures. And I don't really use this classification. I just uh, describe the findings. Uh, Tayson. All right, looks like we have a, an avulsion fracture maybe at the anterior inferior iliac spine. On the right side over here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. There's the uh, bicep, I mean the uh, rectus, the, femur. rectus femurs. Thank you. Here's the indirect and the direct heads. As you all know, the direct head goes to the inferior pubic ramus. And as you said, this is an avulsion fracture uh, at that insertion. Okay. And here we can see the avulsion injury of the inferior pubic, uh, anterior inferior iliac spine in this area with a lot of edema around it. Okay. Uh, Eliora. Okay, left hip trauma. <clears throat> um, I don't, I don't see that much here. Okay. Uh, increased signal in the acetabulum. It's on the T one. Yeah, it saturates out. I mean. Could be fat, so focal fat in the so lipoma. Okay. Okay, uh, Tayson. All right. So a lot of destruction of this inferior pubic ramus, symphysis pubis region. Yeah, this patient was walking around for one month with this comminuted fracture. Yeah. And here we can see the bilateral sacral fractures, as well as the symphysis pubis and inferior pubic rami. Is that a hematoma there? Yeah, with a hematoma. Yeah. Okay, uh, Eliora. 71 year old male with right hip pain for a month. Mm, I don't see very much here. Mm, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, so there's a, yeah, it looks like a fracture of the iliac, the right iliac wing, yeah, some displacement. Those iliac wings are hard to see on plane radiographs. 
and but here you can clearly see and it'd be easily seen on a CT scan as well. <coughs> Here you can see the displaced fracture. Okay, Tayson. All right, looks like a pediatric patient. I think there's some widening of the isis there at the greater tuberosity. All right. Mm -hmm. There's the other side. Okay. So, looks like a loss of that physis on the right femoral head. Is this like a skiffy? Okay. Yeah. So here we, we can see the that... problems on the left. Yeah, the problems on the left. See here, I don't know why I showed the right first, but here's a normal orientation of the uh, epiphysis and metaphysis. Here we can see this is abnormal. There's actually a shift where there is less overlap superiorly, more overlap inferiorly. Uh, the physis is uh, better visualized here. This is a subtle... Uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis. If you go to the frog, frog leg view, often these are much more easily seen here. Right. Also, John, guys, and uh, if you look at the lesser trochanter on the left, you see it because the leg is externally rotated. On the right, you don't. Uh, here again, is something that kind of Tells you something. And also a little osteoporosis on the left, I think. Don't you, John? Maybe. That I, that, that's hard it's to hard see. It's hard to tell, but I, it's kind of suspicious for it. It's been there for a while. Suspicious. Usually, usually the pain in these are start early, and they should be caught, caught early. Uh, but um, uh, this has been here probably for a couple of weeks or more, maybe, maybe, maybe a month or so right. or more. Yep. Good. Okay, so one way to look at these is look at the epiphyseal torsion angle, uh, where the, uh, the epiphysis should be, uh, the, the overlap between the epiphysis and the diaphysis here should be equal on both sides. With subcapital femoral epiphysis, usually what you have is, though rarely it can be the opposite direction, the Epiphysis will slip uh, inferiorly, and uh, you'll get more overlap here than there. And if you do, if you draw a line that goes right down the neck, uh, bicep thing, the uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, metaphyseal uh, physial junction, <coughs> and draw another line bisecting the epiphyseal. Uh, fecial junction, uh, you'll get an abnormal angle here. Uh, and greater than 20 degrees is abnormal, signifying that you have a subcapital femoral epiphysis. And in this day and age, uh, we really don't use this so much. We do an MR scan, and what you'll see is edema within the growth plate, which lets you know that you've you've got a fracture going all the way along the, the growth plate. Uh, and then we can better see the slippage in the bones as well. Okay. I'm sorry. Who's next? I am. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. On the, we have a young patient here. We see on the right side, there's, again, a slipped capital. Right. Epiphysis. Yeah. And notice how irregular the f growth plate is. The growth plate should be much smoother than this. Uh, here there is, we can clearly see the slippage and the typical pattern. On the other side, this is an abnormal growth plate as well, markedly irregular there. There's less slippage on the left than there is on the right. But again, there's a pretty straight line here at the uh, 
uh, cortical interface between the uh, neck and the head, and we have a more of a little bump here, so there is slippage of the uh, epiphysis on the left side as well as the right side. And on the sagittal images, we can see marked slippage uh, on both sides as well. So this is a typical appearance of slip capital femoral epiphyses. Uh, uh, just another example, and the bone marrow edema really uh, helps a lot in knowing which which of these are really active. So here we can see another slip capital femoral epiphysis on the right side with a little bit of edema and a slippage of the uh, epiphysis. Uh, John, do you want to talk about the treatment for this? Well, the treatment is uh, one or two nails uh, will do it. Uh, the, the whole idea is to make sure that you don't perforate uh, um, to the cartilage. You have to be four millimeters um, below the articular surface centrally. And uh, this one is a bit low. Um, I was so this one would need two screws, not one. Um, okay. Otherwise, uh, it, it, it's okay. It should heal. But uh, that's a little low. Yeah, there's a little slippage on the opposite side as well. Yeah, I would fix that as well, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next case. All right. So, so we have some sclerosis at that uh, metadiaphysis on the left side. Yeah, notice the asymmetry in the size of the epiphyses here with some increased density. And uh, here, yeah, we can. Yeah, uh, so yeah, a lot of deformity of that femoral head. Yeah. It's like a, a vascular necrosis of this femoral head. Well, no, this is just a lot of slippage. This is more slippage than we saw on the other ones. This is a uh, more, more extreme example. Now, you know, one thing about surgery, uh, it, it's a, it, you can go to the next uh, slide, John. Um, yeah, th this is a, a very small uh, in diameter screw. I, I, I would not be comfortable with that. Uh, I would put two in there. Otherwise, it's, a, it's perfect. Okay. Uh, yeah, notice that they did reposition the epiphysis. Uh, in uh, this that, case. Uh, you, you do not do that. That is done by putting the patient on an operating table. Uh, and and securing the leg uh, and foot to, 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 uh, in a proper position. You do not pull on that leg and try to reduce it forcibly. That is just, you just don't do that. You get AVM, and that's something that you don't want to do because they'll haunt you until the yeah. person is 25 years of age. Uh, here just so forceful reduction is a no-no. Okay, uh, then this is just the last case for today. Here's pre op 613 1998. We can see a big slip capital femoral epiphysis uh, here. Uh, looks very chronic, marked slippage. Uh, here they nailed it, they repositioned it, just like John was talking about. They put in uh, two screws in this particular. That's a beautiful fixation, but. And this is what it looked like. This is uh, 1998. And this is what it looked like in 2002. Well, that's, that's a no-no. Yeah, because uh, you can destroy the, the blood supply to the epiphysis and get a, a uh, infarct and avascular necrosis uh, when, when that's done. No, this is exactly. There's no treatment for this uh, until the patient gets old. And gets a hip replacement, right. Okay, why don't we stop here and we'll pick up at this point uh, tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Thank tomorrow you. Tomorrow is Wednesday. No, tomorrow's, tomorrow's Tuesday, Tuesday, I guess. Yeah.
Yeah, tomorrow's Tuesday. I'm sorry. Thanks.